So the topic of session two is hyper-connected life. As advanced uh, information and communication technologies, 5G networks and new modes of transportation make communica communication across the globe both stranger, but both stronger and easier. We'll take talk about the problems in the world with ever-growing interdependence. So we'll have a young graduate engineer to speak. Uh, I now invite Mr. Dong Su Jun to the stage. Mr. Jun served as the president of the Young Engineers Honor Society, sponsored by the National Academy of Engineering of Korea. Dong Su, are you ready? Okay. Please introduce yourself and tell us your thoughts on hyper-connected life. Uh, uh. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Dear Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolute honor for me to take part in today's opening. I am Dong Su Jun, 24 years old, and I'm a PhD student in a school of integrated technology at Yonsei University. I also served as a chairman of Young Engineers Honor Society at the NIEK. And my research field is next generation wireless communication and mm -hmm. each application. I think the main keyword of the first industrial revolution and digital transformation is connectivity. And we are now entering a hyper-connected society. This means that the economic of scale are no longer determined by the scale of capital or labor, but through the scale of connection in the future. And 5G new radio technologies will be play a role of game changers that lead to this paradigm shift. Also, the immersive and mission critical services such as finance, media, distribution, and manufacturing will be made possible in the future. Furthermore, the ICT convergence of including AI and big data along with 5G will, be, uh, will make the world intelligent and will create innovations in life and business such as smart vehicle, smart factory, smart healthcare, and even smart city. However, behind the new possibilities, there are also uh, some challenges such as vulnerability of personal information, security, and inequality in information accessibility, and compatibility of technology and policy. So then, in 2020, as the untaxed life is receiving attention due to COVID-19, the importance of 5G hyper-connected society is I think so much of attention and that is overcoming the limitation of space. So today, I would like to introduce the opening of Cage 2020 session two by addressing the following questions. First, how can the utilization and protection of data generated by individuals, organizations, and cities be harmonized? Second, uh, in a hyper-connected society, the mobile communication technology is not just only for smartphones, but also is moving toward some new fields such as transportation and medical care. Then, what will the use cases of smart hyper-connected society look like? Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. John, for your insight. And next, it's time to invite someone who could give us an answer to um, his question he just raised. Professor Lee Ingen, Ingen Lee, the moderator of session two. Uh, he served as the head of um, the Land and Housing Institute. And he's a member of NAIC, of course, and currently with Seoul National University as a visiting professor. I'll now hand the, mic the microphone over to Professor Lee. Thank you, Young, for your kind introduction. Thank you. Good day, everybody. It's my great pleasure to chair this session two, Hyperconnected Life. Actually, 
you experience what the hyper-connected society is like, like through this session today. Due to COVID-19, we have only a handful of audience here in Seoul, but hundreds of audience are connected through YouTube now. To answer Dong Su's question, we are very fortunate today. We have wonderful and great six speakers and panelists for this session. They are now in Korea, Australia, France, England, Sweden, but you are connected with internet. I would like to invite three speakers first to deliver their speeches, and then we will have three panelists for discussions. Afterwards, I would like to have questions and also some thought to share from the audience. So if you have any questions, something to share with us, please leave them through the chat room in, in the YouTube. I'll introduce them in question and answer time later. Now I'd like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Hong Wan-pyo. He is currently president and CEO of Samsung SDS, the largest IT solutions and service providers in Korea. Before joining SDS, he was president and the chief marketing officer of Samsung Electronics, it's an electronic giant, yeah? where he played a crucial role in positioning Samsung as the world's premier smartphone provider and a globally valued brand. He's a member of NAEK, Korean Academy of Engineering. Due to unavoidable engagement, he couldn't be here today. However, you are able to hear his speech on video. His title is Realizing a Hyper-Connected Life Through ICT. Great to meet you, and congratulations on hosting such a wonderful seminar. Before I begin, I would like to thank you for giving me this great opportunity to be a part of this seminar. Now we are evolving into hyper-connected life. Thanks to advancements in ICT, 5G networks, and new modes of transportation. Connecting people, things, and spaces is becoming more complete and diverse. This connectivity will change individual lives enhance work flexibility, and help provide balanced social change. Connectivity will ultimately lead to the fusion of the physical and the digital world. There are three characteristics that define this ICT-led transformation to a connected society. Hyper-connectivity, hyper-intelligence, and hyper-speed. Advances in 5G and IoT are extending communication from person to person to person to things and the rising expectations for innovations. Super data sets produced by trillions of hyper-connected things and processed by high-performance cloud are accelerating the advent of intelligence in our lives. Connectivity, intelligence, automation, and data security are four important tech enablers that will have a major impact on this ICT-led transformation. First, connectivity serves as an infrastructure that supports a hyper-connected life. Second, intelligence brings about the disruptive innovation to both individuals and enterprises. Third, automation is a powerful tool that creates efficient end-to-end -end processes. And lastly, data security is a precondition for being able to realize hyper-connectivity. Let's take a look at how each of these drivers can be applied to both personal and enterprise use cases. 
Connectivity includes not only telecommunications and the networks, but also data generating sensors. Looking at connectivity in consumer devices, the growing usage of wearable devices is leading to a surge of data. Data can be utilized for personalized services. In addition to smart watches and wristbands, ear usage has also grown considerably. This includes not only audio experience, but also diverse services, such as smart assistant, translation, and more. Eyewear, such as IR glasses, is also anticipated to see an increased usage. In just two years, the number of wearable devices shipment have increased three times from 130 million in 2017 to 342 million in 2019. This has also led to available applications to increase 12 times. That is more than the growth of wearable devices. These diverse IoT sensors and services generate more data while strongly supporting personal connectivity. Looking at connectivity for industrial applications, IoT sensors and edge devices are collecting massive amounts of data on site in real time. It provides new analytical opportunities. As an example in action, we can look at the Samsung Group's semiconductor fabrication lines. While information regarding semiconductor manufacturing is confidential, the area of Samsung's largest semiconductor complex is equivalent to the size of 400 soccer fields. We operate roughly 20 fab lines all over the world. The typical size of the fab line is 520 meters long, 200 meters wide, and 80 meters tall. A single fab line generally has eight different operating processes at least 3,000 pieces of equipment for each process, and two to 300 IoT sensors collecting data every second. This results in over 2.2 petabyte data being produced a month for each fab line. By collecting this massive amount of data, we can automate 99.7% of manufacturing operations. That's why we can operate with only 20 operation engineers inside the FEM line. This connectivity and the big data also benefits the development of intelligence. We are utilizing this big data in order to rapidly train AI through deep learning. It creates intelligence that can be applied to real world use cases. For smart home, there has been explosive growth in the adoption of AI speakers. It has taken only five years for over 50% of households to acquire an AI speaker in the US. The adoption rate for AI speakers has outpaced computers, the internet, TVs, and even smartphones. Alexa, for example, can perform 100,000 services through simple voice commands, such as ordering goods, or reserving movie tickets. In a matter of years, every home device will be interconnected, and AI assistants will provide customized spaces for family members. Intelligence has also improved manufacturing operations. Each year, over a trillion MLCCs are produced. A smartphone contains more than 1,000 MLCCs it is as small as a single strand of hair. Thanks to applying intelligence to manufacturing, we can now complete the training of 100,000 visual data in a shorter amount of time by auto-labeling and automated distributed training. Furthermore, applying this refined data allows real-time detection of defects. This also improves the inspection accuracy as well as the ability to detect how to find the defects unnoticed by human operator. This defect analysis improves the yields and decreases the reinspection rate from double digit to single digit. It ultimately saves $50 million in productivity per year. 
To showcase the impact of intelligence for insurance companies, I would like to share a use case where we applied deep learning based image analytics to vehicle damage analysis. Visual AI has developed from classification to detection and now segmentation. Therefore, it can more precisely classify the object. It is now possible to extract data from two dimensional images and determine which area of the vehicle has been damaged. Smartphones that have time of flight sensors now can take a 2D image and reconstruct it in 3D with the help of deep learning. This technology helps insurance companies to standardize pricing and improve the accuracy of vehicle repair quotations. By improving the accuracy of size and depth measurements, we have achieved 96% accuracy for our damage analysis. That means the quotation produced from this analysis have the same level of accuracy as an experienced professional insurance agent. Automation makes connectivity and intelligence possible by decreasing the time required for data collection and processing while eliminating manual errors. If we classify the basic human actions into acting, sensing, and thinking, automation is being developed as a substitute for human actions. Therefore, it becomes more advanced in each of those three actions. Automation is a powerful tool. It covers everything from performing simple and repetitive tasks to autonomously judging and handling work without human intervention. The logistics industry has been plagued by a manual process that hamper efficiency. Updating shipping information for products being transported from the factory to the re retailers had to be done pretty much manually. Every day, at least 27,000 inquiries are made to various companies for shipping updates. The shipping information, which is non-standardized and differs for each carrier, then had to be entered into Excel and analyzed. By process automation, shipment tracking queries, data entry, report distribution, and even alarms for potential delays can be automated to save over 60,000 hours and secure logistics visibility. Now, I would like to show a higher level of automation with our AICR-based financial compliance screening. AICR stands for AI Character Recognition, and it applies deep learning to train AI to recognize different fonts and document types. AICR improves character recognition accuracy with image processing, recognition, and post-correction. By applying AICR-based automated screening, every bank employee has to simply scan a document and then automation will handle the rest. AICR recognizes the characters in the document while text analytics technology distinguishes the type of document and extracts any screened word. These are compared with the bank's restricted vocabulary list, and then AI will determine if there are any compliance issues. Thanks to AI and AI banking agent, we can improve our screening efficiency by analyzing five times more documents in the same amount of time. This allows employees to focus on in-depth screenings and ultimately decrease errors while improving the screening quality. The technological advancements that make a hyper-connected life possible are providing new benefits and new sources of value. However, individuals and organizations need to be aware of two key challenges regarding data protection and security. The increase in both the number and the scale of cyber attacks, as well as data usage, means that the types of security threats are becoming more diverse. This has resulted in growing importance to secure data, applications, and systems. 
from increasingly advanced external threats. While there are various social and governmental attempts at dealing with those problems, I would like to focus on the technological solutions that our company is developing and applying in the field. This can be classified into two groups, data leaks and hacking prevention technology, and reliable data transaction technology. I would like to cover the first technology related to data leaks and hacking prevention. That is a threat intelligence. Security solutions and devices are coming under great attack. Our daily detection log for the month of August averaged 17 billion per day. Through security orchestration, we have succeeded in lowering the number of security events to be analyzed down to only 20,000. It was done by automating the integration and control of various security solutions. For those 20,000 events, it will take approximately 10 minutes to manually respond to each attack. In order to prevent additional attacks, we need to analyze the past history of similar events. Which attack methods were utilized? How dangerous the event was? The optimal allocation of resources and more. The analysis time can be cut down from 10 minutes to just one minute. 400 experts had to work to carry out this process manually. But now, it can be accomplished with only 40 experts. Thereby, it improves your work efficiency 10 times. The second technology of data leaks and hacking prevention is a homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption is gaining attention as a top data security technology these days. It allows data processing and analyzing in an encrypted state. Thereby, it blocks the source of data leaks while improving the processing speed. By allowing calculations on data in an encrypted state, homomorphic encryption can preserve addition and multiplication operations. The result for the cipher text is identical to the result for the decrypted plain text. For instance, homomorphic encryption increases the value of your data by allowing to combine different sets of data from other parties. Sharing, combining, and analyzing data in an encrypted state gives you the ability not only to protect the personal data, but also to develop a more precise analytics model. We are also seeing more government action regarding the use of personal data. For example, in Korea, the government laid out the groundwork for a data usage law. It covers the combination and the transfer of anonymous data. This requires each bureau to standardize their data regulations. Now, I would like to discuss a technology that improves the reliability of data transactions. From a data sharing perspective, blockchain is a framework that satisfies our need for transparency, reliability, and cost effectiveness. Blockchain can be classified into two categories. Public network, which is used for cryptocurrencies and personal transactions. And the private network, which is primarily used by enterprises. There are three major use cases for the application of a private blockchain. Again, it is based on reliability and transparency. There are asset tracking, digital identity, and smart contracts. In order for blockchain to see full-blown adoption among enterprises, the issue regarding the transaction speed needs to be resolved. This issue happens during the consensus processes. So we developed our accelerator with adaptive algorithm. It improves transaction speed 10 times compared to existing blockchains. Another issue that needs to be addressed is interconnection between different blockchain networks. So we apply the technology that can connect heterogeneous blockchain platforms. The ability to apply these technological advancements to individuals, 
enterprises, and the society requires a diverse understanding and cooperative ecosystems. Samsung has joined international cooperative organizations such as 3GPP and Industrial Internet Consortium. We intend to actively lead the development of international standards for technology. SAI is one of our key competencies. We are striving to create a more responsible and ethically sound AI. We are researching and innovating this technology at seven AI centers around the world. One of our top priorities is to develop responsible AI. We have announced our commitment to developing AI that makes a positive impact on society. We joined the partnership on AI along with other global companies and the private organizations. We also hold the annual Samsung AI Forum to share insights and the value of technological developments. In our opinion, academic, enterprise, and government institutions must work together in order to realize a hyper-connected future. I hope the topic that I have discussed today has provided some new insight to you, especially regarding the technologies enabling our smart society. Once again, it has been an honor to participate in this seminar. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hong, for your excellent presentation. He summarized how our life evolving into hyper-connected life through continuous advancement in ICT technology. He is specifically focusing on four technology enablers, connectivity, intelligence, automation, and data security. He also introduced various application cases. Thank you again for his wonderful presentation. Now I'd like to invite second speaker, Hugh Bradlow from Melbourne, Australia. He's the president of Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering. He was previously chief technical officer and head of innovation at Telstra the largest mobile network in Australia. He is globally recognized as thought leader in telecommunications. His title is Technology and the Pandemic, a scorecard. Please join me in welcoming President Hugh Bradlow. Hugh, Thank you, the floor yeah. is yours. Thanks very much, Francis. I take it you can hear me. Um, Thank you very much to the National Academy of Engineering of Korea for inviting me to make this presentation. I'm just very, very disappointed that I couldn't be in Seoul in person. It's one of my favorite cities in the world and I'd love to be there, but this has to do, and this is uh, because uh, of, obviously because of the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. Because the pandemic's dominated our lives so much this year, I thought it made sense to talk about the role of technology in, a, um, in mitigating the impact of the technology and uh, of the pandemic. And so I thought I'd develop a scorecard to see how well we did in terms of using technology. But to start off, I started thinking about what would happen if, um, if the COVID-19 pandemic had occurred in 2003 when we had SARS. In other words, how would we have fared in 2003 if we had had uh, such a deadly disease with asymptomatic transition, uh, transmission sorry, um, in 2003? And I compare the figures between 2003 and 2020 for uh, the penetration of technology in our society. These are based on Australian figures, but are not necessarily that dramatically different from many other countries. So um, I... Um, would observe that the things that have changed dramatically between 2003 and 2020 are the penetration of broadband in consumer homes, the penetration of smartphones, which didn't even exist in 2003, 
And cloud systems had just started up. Amazon Web Services came along in 2002, and now, of course, have achieved widespread adoption. And those three technology developments have enabled various software systems which we rely on greatly, like video conferencing or cloud-based contact systems or even telehealth systems to um, become widely available and therefore allow us to do a number of functions in 2020 that just wouldn't have been possible in uh, 2003. And um, the, the main ones have been, of course, teleworking, teleeducation, telehealth, online retail and online food delivery on which we've relied greatly this year. Um, and you can see that we, I, I will go through how we've done in terms of adopting these technologies, but one thing that's clearly happened this year is the pande pandemic has delivered a major shock to the consumers in terms of how to adopt technologies. So uh, the graph I've got there is a US figure, but in the first eight weeks of the pandemic this year, the percentage of online retail sales increased more than in the previous decade. So it really took this pandemic to get us adopting the technology. And so what I'd like to go through is how prepared were we for the technology adoption? And I, this is a problem that's concerned me for some time. In 2016, um, when I became president of ATSI, I instituted a program of work to look at technology preparedness in Australia. How I knew that the technologies were there, but how prepared was the population in terms of consumer and business to adopt those technologies? We started off with transport because, as you can see in the slide, um, because of population growth, uh, the transport system in Australia is under increasing pressure, and that pressure was increased, uh, expected to grow considerably to 2030. But at the same time, there are also new technologies emerging in the form of autonomous vehicles um, that will enable us to reduce the pressure on the transport system and um, to improve the safety overall. But how prepared were people to adopt them? So we surveyed stakeholders across Australia, and the short answer is we found they were about half ready. Um, the governments and road authorities had started thinking about the problem, but really hadn't yet got around to doing that much about it. Ironically, um, for the time being at least, the problem has gone away because of the pandemic, but nevertheless, that started us thinking about various act aspects of technology preparedness. So I'm gonna go through various aspects of technology now and give them a scorecard, starting with working from home. This is an area obviously that has increased dramatically this year. Prior to this year, uh, working from home, which I define as people who spend more than 80% of their work time at home, was around about 10%, and that number hadn't changed much over the period. My figures are from 2013, but there wasn't significant movement before 2020. Suddenly in 2020, 30, more than 30% of the population was working from home. In the United States, it was up to 42%. And um, that has worked very well thanks to broadband and to those cloud services like Zoom that we're using today that have ena enabled us to do this work. Um, but um, it wasn't 100% effective. And one of the main problems we've struck is the lack of preparedness for cybersecurity for people working from home. And for some reason, 91% um, of cyber attacks start with an email. But the sheer surge in the number of scam and phishing emails this year shows that um, scammers were getting value out of uh, cyber attacks, much more so when people are working at home. So my report card for working from home is a B. Um, the next area I looked at was playing from home. Um, and in this area, I'd probably give our scorecard an A because um, one of the things that we were able to do thanks to the internet and broadband is collaborative fitness activities. And just to give you a data point on that, Peloton, which is the um, company that does collaborative fitness ac activities, including cycling, their sales went up 172% over the last six months. And they had fitness sessions running online with up to 23,000 participants. Um, for those who couldn't afford uh, the cost of these uh, quite expensive systems and services, 
There was also the massive growth in esports, um, which is watching other people play computer games, which to me strikes me as a very strange activity. I guess that's just showing my age. But that has also grown dramatically over the past year. So there was an area where we can give a, a scorecard of an A. But from now on, it tends, tends to go downhill. So obviously, we had to take students out of school. The educational system was totally unprepared, even though the technologies are available, was totally unprepared for learning from home. And um, they were scrambling to catch up and enable students to actually study online from home. And it has been a slow and somewhat imperfect process. On top of that, for many students, um, they lacked the necessary facilities to work from home. That was relatively easily fixed by our government who handed out uh, broadband uh, wireless connectivity, as well as um, computers for those who couldn't afford them and didn't have them. But that still didn't solve the problem that for many students, they were working from a crowded environment and therefore uh, it was very difficult to actually study from home. But even worse, as we move forward, we're hitting the problem now that it turns out it's not possible to effectively and reliably examine students unless you bring them into a controlled space. Um, people have tried AI solutions to examinations and they've been an abject failure. It just doesn't work. So we are not able to do reliable exams. And of course, in the Southern Hemisphere, we're getting to the time of year when students need to use the exams. Um, the other area we failed in is in engagement measures. So when a teacher's in a classroom, they can see the reaction of the students and they know how engaged they are. But we haven't introduced the online capabilities that would enable us to do the same thing for remote students. For example, headbands um, like the student is wearing there, which measure EEG and give um, some sort of engagement measure, or even emotion detecting cameras that would give the student better feedback about how well their teaching is going. So in the case of online education, I would give it a very narrow pass. It's just made the grade, I would say. But unfortunately, we go further downhill when we get to telehealth. So in Australia, prior to the pandemic, the only um, area that telehealth was allowed or health, remote health consultations was for people in remote areas who did, needed psychiatric um, examinations. Um, the billing systems didn't even enable telehealth consultations. So again, there was a scrambling to, enable, to make that possible. And um, even so, the medical system was poorly prepared for the use of these systems and had very crude, crude and still is using crude means for doing uh, health consult consultations like Skype or even just ordinary phone calls. Furthermore, um, we our electronic health record system, even despite 20 years of efforts, is still not being widely used. And so simple workflows like being able to go from a consultation to a diagnostic test to um, a pharmacy dispensing drugs are still not being used in our health record systems. And therefore, I would say our adoption of telehealth has been a fail. Um, the next area um, where we failed is in IoT preparedness. The IoT, Internet of Things technologies, um, uh, are, have been available for some time and we could have used them much more effectively. Um, so the first area they were tried is in the exposure notification apps, um, which various countries, have, including Australia, have deployed, but have been an abject failure again. Um, and apparently in Australia, not one single person has been notified of an exposure when using the app. And there's been reasonably widespread adoption, about 20 to 30% of the population. So um, that is a reflection of poor implementation and poor preparedness. The second area we could have used um, IoT would be in surveillance to ensure, enforce social distancing using cameras with some machine learning and machine vision to uh, make sure that people are maintaining their social distance in public places and even in private spaces. So that has been something that has not been adopted and could have been used to uh, enforce the social distancing measures that we need to curb the spread of the pandemic. And then the third area where IoT could have played a role but hasn't would be in having 
um, instantaneous diagnostic tests that will detect people who are asymptomatic but in fact have the disease. And that could have helped control the spread of the disease around the society and between countries. And we'll need measures like that if we're going to reopen our international borders, which of course is essential for global collaboration. So um, the another opportunity that was missed in this pandemic was um, manufacturing. We could have been using in industry 4.0 technologies, um, the so-called industrial uh, internet of things, um, to automate factories in the way the gentleman from Samsung was describing, and therefore enable us to rely far less on overseas supply chains and have a, uh, an effective uh, system uh, for manufacturing locally. And for some reason, we ran out of toilet paper in Australia um, other, um, for no good reason, because that's one thing which we can actually manufacture. But I would expect us in the post-COVID world to do far more manufacturing locally using Industry 4.0 technologies. And then the final failure I want to mention is social inclusion. We have failed to bring the population along with the technologies. So the first point is there's an infodemic of fake, fake stories going around, which pose a considerable threat to um, the adoption of technology. For example, the, the absolute nonsense that 5G causes COVID, um, it's a stupid idea, but for some reason, millions of people believe in it. And that's, again, a technology failure that we haven't been able to get to those people and help them understand that this is a complete nonsense. The second area is that um, we have many people in our society, about 60% of workers or frontline workers or people who actually have to travel to their work and have to work in place versus information workers who um, are those who are fortunate of uh, us and who are able to work off broadband technology and work from home. Um, those information workers are often poorly paid. Um, and in fact, in the United States, uh, the 60% of workers who are frontline workers only um, earn about half the amount of money of information workers per capita. Um, and because they're poorly paid, they have to go to work even if they're not feeling well. And of course, that has led to, uh, and exacerbated the spread of the disease. Um, no one has recognized that public transport is a critical infrastructure, in, and well, they have recognized that, but they were incredibly slow in Australia to enforce mask wearing on public transport, which has been another failure. And then finally, at the moment, we're facing a, a mental health crisis because of the lockdowns and uh, the social deprivations that are occurring in the society. So in conclusion, I'd like to say we've had the technology. Um, we could have adopted it far more effectively if we were um, better prepared. And um, if we don't think about the design of technology with social inclusion in mind, it will fail us the next time this sort of crisis occurs. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you. So where's the Korea scorecard? Here. Uh, I, I, I was hoping you'd ask me that. You've done considerably better than us. I can't judge the effectiveness of things like your cybersecurity at home because obviously I don't have the visibility of that and I don't know enough about your health system, but you've certainly used the technology to control the spread of the disease far more effectively. So uh, please come to Seoul to mark our case. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Hugh, for your wonderful presentation. He introduced Australia's experience during pandemic. He showed the technological change between SARS 2003 and COVID-19 this year. We actually we achieved enormous technological development during this period. However, it's more interesting. Pandemic has been the trigger for widespread adaptation of new technology. He also highlighted the shortcomings of technology and the relationship between technology and the society. Right, thanks again, and please stay here uh, until, because you have a Q&A session later. Now yeah. I'd like to invite Young Tae Kim from Paris, France. 
Three years ago, he was elected as the Secretary General of International Transport Forum, an intergovernmental body with 62 members. Before joining ITF, he worked for the Ministry of Land, Infrastructure and Transport in Korea. He was responsible for various transport policies, including autonomous vehicles, intelligent transport systems, and road safety. His title is Transport and Hyperconnected Life, Opportunities and Challenges. Please join me in welcoming Young Tae Kim. Young Tae, the floor is yours. Hello. Good morning, everybody from Paris. Do you hear me? Okay. Uh, I'm very honored to be a part of uh, this interesting event today, and I'm very sorry that I couldn't uh, make it to uh, Korea, my homeland country. And today, um, I want to speak about uh, the transport sector, which is um, which seems to be an easy sector because we all experience it every day. But in fact, there are so many uh, complicated aspects and uh, so many uh, difficult questions in it. And before going into the detail, I would like to uh, give you a brief uh, introduction of the ITF where I work. And ITF, International Transport Forum, is the only global body dealing with the all modes of transport. And uh, we are an uh, intergovernment organization with 62 member countries. And we are a think tank and platform uh, producing a lot of uh, research papers every year. And every research paper is freely downloadable from, from our website. And we organize an annual summit in Leipzig. Uh, it's a summit for uh, the ministers of transport for the transport community. And our mission is to foster a deeper understanding uh, of the role of transport in economic growth and in environmental sustainability and social inclusion. And basically we have five major themes today in, in transport that we are focusing on. And um, they are digitalization and connectivity and safety and security and universal access and decarbonization. And traditionally, when we uh, thought about uh, transport, and we usually thought about the modal aspect. So we imagined uh, the railway and ship and cars and etc. But these days, uh, we know that there are more complicated words in the transport sector. And we try to combine transport sector with other areas as well to, to, solve, the, uh, solution, to solve the problems in our, in our society. And these are mutually non-exclusive, they are interconnected. And for example, uh, digitalization, we uh, dealt with the data-led governance of road freight transport and also uh, mobility systems and automated driving and also uh, technologies and lifestyle of the value chain. And basically uh, in the past, we focused on modal aspect, as I mentioned, but now we are focusing more on multimodal and intermodal aspect of transport. And in the past, it was supply driven. So we very much focused on the, uh, the provision of the, the authorities like government and local governments and public entities. But now it's more demand driven. And also uh, we focused on hardware in the past, whereas now we focus on software, uh, depending on the, uh, the dig digital technology and etc. And uh, also um, we focused on conventional and manual aspect of the transport, but now we uh, value more automation. So as you see uh, on this slide, so we are now moving in this direction that I think everyone can agree on this uh, evolution. So now we are heading for the artificial intelligence, but we are not really sure what our future might be like in the future. And one of the interesting topics of today is mobility as a service, so-called mass. And in the past, we uh, used the term transport rather than mobility, focusing on the uh, aspect, physical aspect like equipment and infrastructure development and uh, renovation and etc. But now we very much focus on uh, the term mobility in the sense that it can um, 
means something uh, something uh, soft and uh, software and uh, something flexible, something more technology. So for, for example, if you see uh, this slide, we have a lot of different types of platforms today, not only in the transport sector, but also in the other sectors as well. But if we focus on the transport sector only, we can think about bicycle platform and railway platform and car platform and automobile and motorcycle platform, etc. The platform can be connected also to other platforms, which can finally create some synergies. That means that we are becoming more and more interconnected and hyper-connected. So basically uh, in, in mass platform, we can have all types of transport mode in one system. And usually we talk about innovation and revolution. So now uh, we are entering a fourth industrial revolution, but uh, that means that it's totally different from evolution. And uh, when we talk about revolution, we also uh, have to discuss disruptions that we are facing. And disruption means uh, clearly uncertainty. So we usually uh, have a tendency to uh, think about positive things about digital technology and, and brighter side of our, our life today. But basically sometimes we uh, forget about uncertainty that lingers uh, in every part of our life. And data is becoming more and more important as all of you know already. And that is, that is the case uh, in the transport sector too. And this is one example of the modeling uh, analysis uh, that we did in ITF. And we uh, focused on four uh, cities, including uh, Lisbon and Helsinki and Auckland in New Zealand. And, um, I cannot really go into the detail in the interest of time, but it shows how many cars can be taken out from the road if you want to uh, replace it with a shared mobility and uh, how much uh, CO2 can be reduced by uh, the reducing the number of cars on the road. So um, I guess uh, my presentation will be shared by all of you. So I will skip this uh, the detailed explanation. And I'm moving on to the next theme uh, of the five major themes in the transport sector. The universal access is very important today. It reflects a certain uh, sort of a social aspect of transport. So uh, basically um, we can think about uh, the transport weaker like aged group and uh, the women and uh, people in living in remote area and low income households. So we, we can assume that everyone has the right to transport today and we uh, should not ignore this valuable social aspect of transport questions. And we also have a lot of policy options, including technological options and also uh, government subsidies and uh, security options. And gender is, is becoming a hot topic today. Uh, in, in Asian society, it's, it's less visible compared to a Western world in, in, the, uh, in, in Europe and in, in America and Western societies, uh, now equality between uh, the men and women and uh, in terms of the opportunity, job opportunity and safety and security, uh, these questions are really being dealt with uh, seriously these days. And what is the challenge related to this topic? And we have some bias coming from unbalanced representation in the decision-making process. So traditionally, we have a lot of male decision-makers in the uh, Ministry of Transport and Ministry of Infrastructures. That means that we didn't really pay attention to the weak points that women, uh, women uh, had in, in the past. So uh, basically when we designed infrastructures, we had some bias, uh, uh, subconscious bias that uh, the infrastructures was designed more favorably for the men uh, in, in, in general. And also we have a fixed perception on infrastructure. And now in the future, uh, as society is changing very rapidly, we need uh, most probably uh, the flexible infrastructure that can really be uh, adapted to a new surrounding. And there, are, there is a controversy on art, artificial quota for job opportunity. And uh, we also have to think about discrimination issue between uh, weak, socially weak groups. 
And decarbonization is really important topic today because since uh, COP21 in 2015, a Paris Agreement, um, all the nations in the world made a commitment, commitment to reduce the CO2 uh, in their societies. And international organizations, they are working uh, very close together together uh, to uh, solve these questions and to provide some visible visible reference to the policymakers. So uh, for example, in ITF, we uh, uh, recently in late last July this year, we launched it a uh, TCAT. So TCAT meaning Transport Climate Action Directory that contains 60 measures that more than 60 measures that government can use to reduce their CO2 emissions because even though uh, the Ministry of Transport wants to make a decision, they always need to secure some budget. So they have to go to the Ministry of Finance. And finally, they have to bring it to the table for discussion with the parliamentary guy, parliamentary people. And then uh, we have to have uh, clear evidence and quantifiable impact of every measure the government can use. And this uh, reference, this ticket was uh, officially endorsed by the UNFCCC that organizes every year COP, Conference of uh, Parties on Climate Change. So now it's uh, very useful uh, information for transport people and also for environment, environment people and uh, academics. But we have also challenges because when we negotiate uh, on the question of uh, CO2 reductions, usually Ministry of Environment people participate in the discussion, not a transport uh, people participate in the discussion, even though uh, transport occupies 25% of the total CO2 emissions in the world. And there are also two different approaches focusing more on technological development and uh, or on behavior change. But behavior change is not really easy because people should be convinced. And uh, to do so, government always should provide some uh, concrete evidence why we should do this and why we should do that. And also, uh, we need to have an efficient control tower, which is not always the case. And even in every government, in every government, there are some tensions between ministries and uh, the strong competitions with the goodwill, of course. But uh, in the end, unless we have an efficient control tower, the coordination issue, uh, coordination is not really easy. easy. And uh, connectivity issue is also very important because uh, the human history is a kind of uh, the history of overcoming the speed and overcoming the missing link in, in, our, in our life. So um, when we talk about trans, uh, transport connectivity, it can also mean digital and physical and model and spatial and uh, institutional. So it can really cover not only uh, physical and uh, technological aspect, but also social uh, aspect and environmental aspect too. And we also have some challenges and uh, how to finance infrastructure development and how to simplify border crossing procedures because to enhance connectivity, uh, many countries in question, many related countries should share some basic, uh, the ideas and basic strategies so a uh, border crossing uh, procedure, which is mainly administrative uh, the issues, is really uh, important and uh, the difficult task too. And also, we need to standardize uh, every, uh, every part of this connectivity. And intermodal approach is really important because we, we try to combine railway sector with the port sector and railway sector and the vehicle sector as well. And safety and security is a really uh, important topic as well, because when we experience a hyper-connected society in our daily life, that means that we are more and more exposed to uh, the threat uh, of the cyber attack. And uh, recently I also experienced several Zoom bombing uh, when I participate in uh, events like this. But this is really a big issue. And when you run a transport, public transport system, if it's attacked, cyber attacked by uh, someone else, and it can be really a big problem in the society. And road safety, um, we, we know that every year 1.3 million people die on the road. So it's a really great loss uh, in our society. So far, um, 
we recently we uh, mainly talk about COVID-19, but uh, in the end, we also have to pay attention to uh, the death on the road and fatalities uh, related to this, this issue. We uh, publish every year a road safety report. And when we surveyed uh, uh, our member countries, uh, they put forward the questions on safety security first uh, rather than other uh, the issues. So uh, still uh, it's a very important topic and uh, technologically and institutionally, we have to find a solution to solve these problems. But we have some challenges because data that we have officially sometimes is different from the data in reality. So now uh, international organizations like ITF and uh, World Health Organization, they try to reduce the gap between uh, reality and paper. So um, there's a big challenge. And uh, also the question of governance is really important regarding these issues. And when we uh, also introduce uh, autonomous vehicle more in the future, uh, we also uh, have to talk about the ethical issues and uh, the decision making issues related to that technologies. So this is an example of the uh, cyber threat of the cyber attack in, in the transport sectors. The, basically, if we have a broader perspective, um, there is on, on one hand, there is a city and on the other, there's a, there is a, you know, human body. And city and human body, um, we can say that there are static parts and dynamic parts. So in the static part, we, we can imagine housing, office building that do not really move, but transport is like a circulation of blood in our body that delivers oxygen to every part in our society. So basically uh, we can uh, imagine uh, this uh, the interesting comparison uh, between city and human body. And more globally, uh, the big challenge is uh, that's why we have to link to uh, transport sector to other sectors. So transport is a kind of tool for, to, for uh, other sectors like tourism, urbanism, trade, energy, and housing. And if we only focus on transport sector, transport question cannot be, cannot be answered. So we have to work together with other sectors coming out of uh, silos that we maintain the past. And also the big challenge number two is uh, how to bring coordination efficiency to transport sector and who pays for what. People easily talk about um, money and budget and subsidy, but there should be someone who pays for it. So uh, we have to uh, create uh, the clear, the path, uh, especially depending on the consensus, social consensus, uh, who pays for what and how much. And that's also the question of uh, the, the role distribution between central government and local governments. And also universal and flexible design for future change is really uh, the worth uh, reflecting on right now. And the challenge number three is finally uh, more broadly uh, economic and social environment aspects should be uh, properly harmonized but um, it's not easy, but we, we know that uh, it's not easy, but we, we should continue to work on that. And what are the remaining challenges in transport sector? And sharing personal information is not only um, the question in transport sector, but also in our daily life and how to create new job opportunities because we see a great change of the uh, industries today. And also technology and social agreed value that's also a very important question. And experiencing COVID-19 today, and where are we going now? And in the past, we had uh, Genesis, Big Bang, and Columbus. And there was uh, basically the new, new, uh, new stuff. But now we are also experiencing unexpected and surprising uh, the crisis today. And total uncertainty uh, dominates our life. And we... Many people already experienced lockdown and teleworking and stuff. So where are we heading for? And as Socrates said, I know that I know nothing. And basically nobody can really tell uh, what's going to come tomorrow. And, uh, but nevertheless, uh, we can um, 
summarize uh, the impact of COVID-19 on transport and travel. And we know that our economy is deteriorating uh, greatly these days and health as a new crucial factor to consider. We knew that tra public transport should be clean, but they should go more than clean. They should be safe, sanitarily safe these days. And public-private cooperation in dealing with the crisis is really important. So, finally, uh, global efforts toward new norm is also very important. And uh, as we are doing today, uh, a lot of academics and policymakers uh, have to sit together, to table for discussion, and um, distribute the roles properly. And uh, on one hand, the research and discussion is going on, and on the other hand, the rulemaking uh, should go properly. So there should be a role of international organization and also domestic uh, the governments. And ITF publishes every two years uh, the transport outlook. So the last version was 2019 version, and it's also freely uh, downloadable. And we are preparing for the next uh, the version, the 2021 version. And next year in May, uh, from 26 to 28, uh, we organize a summit uh, inviting all the ministers of transport from our member countries and uh, our observer countries on the Irish presidency. So you are also uh, invited. So uh, that's all I prepared for today. It was kind of encyclopedia presentation, but uh, I hope that it gave a little bit of taste and food for thought for your future reflections. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Yangte, for your wonderful presentation. You know. uh, he explained very well how transport, transport is a traditional means of physical connection. It's how it's changing with technological advances. He presented five talks in transport, say digitalization, universal access, safety and security, connectivity, and this carbonization. He also added some opportunities and challenges. Thank you, and let's stay here you know, for our uh, question and answer time. Right, you had a, a wonderful presentations today, and we have got great insight on hyperconnected life. Let's start our discussion session. As I mentioned before, I would like to invite three panelists first, and then to have questions and comments from the audience. I will give seven to eight minutes to each panelist to share their perspective on hyper-connected life. Shall we start from Professor Donyang Kim? He's a professor of urban design at Songyungwan University in Korea, and also director of Smart Green City Laboratory. He has been a chief planner of Seoul Digital Media City since 1997. Please come to the podium, and uh, the floor is yours, Professor Kim. Uh, thank you for introducing me. I'm Donyan Kim, teaching urban design at Sangyunggan University. Uh, I'm a little bit different profession of uh, this seminar, but uh, we are the urban designer to integrate those kind of technology and ideas. So I'm very excited to uh, share our experience and small uh, knowledge to all of you. Uh, uh, as you all know, city is a great outcome of uh, humankind. <clears throat> uh, every era, we focus to solve the urban problems and uh, facing the uh, new demand of all these from the cities. So the cutting edge technology and accumulate wisdom can solve those problems and respond to uh, new demands. I can say that is the uh, kind of system of uh, smart cities. So uh, since city was evolved, uh, human being always focused the improvement of quality of life and 
uh, innovation means of productions. That is the history of the uh, city. <clears throat> uh, previous industrial revolution uh, create the uh, uh, modernism machines and automobile electricities that actually uh, produced uh, mass productions in the cities. Uh, but the thing is, uh, uh, the great symbol of uh, industrial revolution is factory. But in 20th centuries, factory is moved out from the cities due to uh, pollution and noise. Then city remains consumption and service industries. There is no chance to uh, give people an opportunity to participate in the manufacturing and uh, traditional industries. So, uh, service industries, it has uh, two kinds of characteristics. One is someone who has uh, higher education degrees and or the uh, licenses such as lawyer and CPA and others. The other one is a, a simple labor-oriented jobs. So uh, without productions, the function of productions in cities, uh, cities are not the opportunity place for human being anymore. But digital technology actually restore the production and regenerate the city ecosystems. Digital industries and digital technologies uh, that is, uh, stimulate the information and communication technologies. Then uh, the digital manufacturing actually overcome the, all the uh, pro cons of the traditional manufacturing systems. So, uh, creative workers and someone who has uh, ideas, they can produce and research in the city altogether. So city can be the platform and that can be the hyper-connected place for human being and human being to machine and also the machine to machine. So city can be the platform for the entrepreneurs and someone who has talent. So then city ecosystem live, work, and play, promote the industry and education. Then that gives the chance to the people to live in cities and participate in society. Uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, portion of the manufacturing in the cities. That 10% of the traditional manufacturing uh, provoked the noise and pollution. But digital manufacturing industries, it called another ones, Industry 4.0 and a Fourth Industrial Revolution. Then, uh, city is now uh, taking over the index instead of the uh, nation-oriented index. I can say, City of Seoul is a bigger economic volume than Netherlands and South Africa. Actually, uh, I and my research team were surprised about the result. City of Seoul really a uh, bigger in economic volume than uh, Netherlands and South Africa. But the cities are leading economy right now. And some cities realize the, the importance of digital manufacturing it, is, it means, in other words, that is a knowledge-based industries. And also, this industry has a certain characteristic to connect people and connect places. And some cities realize those ideas. Uh, Lower Manhattan in New York, Tech City in London, and Innovation District in Boston. These cities uh, create new industries and uh, new knowledge-based uh, industries, and also the sharing the uh, economic economies. 
And City of Seoul uh, tried to, to create those kind of ecosystems. That is Seoul Digital Media Cities. The bottom, you see the, uh, a park that is size like Central Park in New York. On the, uh, the, 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 up the city sizes, that is the birthplace of digital media industry in Korea. And uh, uh, the stadium is 2002. Korea hosted the World Cup games uh, successfully. Uh, that is a 20 years uh, work experience of city of Seoul. Uh, 20 years ago, this is like this. It is like the world's tallest and biggest garbage dump. 100 meter tall and 100 me one kilometer wide and two kilometer long. And 200 million tons of garbage was landfilled. Actually, that was the uh, uh, side impact of Korea's compressed development. And it was the most abandoned and contaminated site. And now it became the uh, media, digital media ecosystems. I have been participating in this project as a chief planner uh, since 1997. So it is a still ongoing project. And we got some experience of how connection and connecting is important. And the people, especially who has ideas, we call it the entrepreneurs. Uh, these people want the first class infrastructures. But in 1919, uh, there is no world in digital media in Korea. Even the Samsung and LG is uh, not stronger than uh, Sony and uh, uh, Motorola's. But the city of Seoul and national government try to uh, create a new ecosystem as a challenge for the uh, next generations. So uh, this place, the city of Seoul provide the first class infrastructures such as the fastest ICT infrastructure and all the uh, high quality infrastructures who, which is the entrepreneurs want and this digital media industry was requested. The smart city infrastructure is actually that for the hyper connectivities. This infrastructure is the first class of ICT infrastructures. And also, this infrastructure actually interacts with the conventional, industrial, cultural, and uh, green infrastructures to upgrade those kind of the conventional infrastructures. And that uh, the fundamental basis of smart infrastructure is actually 5G and big data. It is a resource of AI and other uh, cutting edge industries. Then uh, Korea has a lot of experience of the building cities, but that was not that great result. So we, uh, the city of Seoul and the planning team realized that this smart infrastructure is supposed to integrate the experience of the city making and also city making industries. It used to be very individual and uh, segmented and uh, developed very uh, deeply into the each silos. So smart city infrastructures put out those uh, experience and technologies to adopt each city's environment. So those are all the, our uh, menu board for applying smart infrastructures and services to the each cities. Um, uh, year 2000, city of Korea, uh, the Seoul Digital Media City created the principle of smart infrastructures. The first one is a provision of customized knowledge and permeable street edges, mix of use, augmented place and urban landscape. And also it could be the helping 
uh, energy efficiency and new renewable energies. And this is a place of uh, digital media cities. Uh, the left one is um, NBC, and all, those are all nationwide uh, TV and broadcasting systems. The middle of that one building is uh, YTN, like the CNN in Korea, and there, are, there is a, a building to uh, accommodate more like 100 startups. Those pictures in, in those pictures, more like uh, 10,000 creative workers are working in that place, and they create uh, 1 billion uh, sales annually. Um, it is a, 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 a city development and city regeneration, but city of Seoul and the planning team focus Digital, create digital media ecosystems. There are uh, 1,000 companies from the small startup to the uh, uh, big corporations like the Samsung and LG. And also there are uh, 50,000 creative workers uh, uh, working in the day and night. And they create ecosystems. And annually 2 billion 20 billion dollars uh, annual sales, and city of Seoul collect uh, 1 million taxes annually. So this is a golden good. Uh, this is a good lays a golden eggs. And all the uh, startup and uh, big corporations are uh, networked, and they think together and share their logistics and produce individually. So it is a kind of a new ecosystem in Korea. And there is a certain new cultures. Uh, the audition is a new culture in Korea, and it was started in Seoul Digital Media Cities. And it is also the birthplace of Gangnam Style, BTS, and Oscar Prize, the uh, Parasite. So it is a a uh, uh, creative milieu of the new cultures, uh, traditional and new digital media cultures. And now, this is the uh, place for the autonomous bus is driving in Sangam Digital Media City as a living lab and an experimental test bed. So it is a future for the other cities. And this place can share their knowledge and experience to the other cities, and also collaborate those kind of researches and you know, the sharing the whole uh, ideas. Uh, as you know, the, uh, we have we face the uh, threat of mankind. The first one is uh, climate change and urbanization. That is actually because of the modernization. In other words, previous industrial revolution's outcome. So each era, we have we faced a, a new uh, demand and urban problems, and also the trial of connection among cities uh, helps that provoke the new disease, uh, corona as a pandemic. So we need to solve those issues. That think I think. Uh, solve the uh, international and global issues, that is actually uh, the spread, of, spread in the time. That's a zeitgeist. So, first, we have to uh, reduce the resources to mitigate the carbons. That is a saving. And second thing is a connecting. Connecting uh, human being to human being to solve the conflict of race, uh, religion, and aging, and other rich and poor. And also, it can be possible to connect human being to machine and machine to machine with this cutting edge infrastructure, we can say smart infrastructure for hyper uh, connectivities then we can create the new values. That is, 
I think, inclusive cities. So we have to choose two things, technology-oriented cities or human being-oriented cities. That is always urban designers' concerns. So uh, probably today's symposium and sharing knowledge can help to make the great cities to make uh, by us to uh, transform these ideas to the, our next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim, and Thanks also so thank you very much for your contribution. So I would like to invite uh, Anne Ruit Johansson from Stockholm, Sweden. She is a general manager, Qualcomm Research and Technology. She is a member of IVA, Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Science. She'll talk about Stockholm's story. She's developing a systems for the Stockholm city. Right, and the podium is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Francis. Um, and uh, hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here, even though I would have been much more happy to be in Seoul today. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some challenges when building a hype connected city. And uh, that will not be from a, a global general perspective, but from a Swedish perspective. And um, more specifically, um, that will be um, uh, from a Stockholm perspective uh, and the vision of Stockholm, uh, which is to be the smartest city in the world 2040. And uh, I guess there's a lot of cities now uh, in that chase. Uh, but from a Stockholm perspective, that means being um, creating a, a smart and connected city with that is also sustainable and is a simpler and better place for people, uh, the citizens, uh, the businesses and the visitors. And there are, of course, a lot of programs ongoing for further digitalization and apply new technology in Stockholm. Um, and the enabling principles that are used or um, considered uh, is as making you know, having solutions that using common digital platforms uh, that having exchanged through central platforms so that different kinds of data handling different kinds of applications can be shared between all the entities uh, within the cities and also externally. It needs to be open standards. Uh, this is one of the issues that we have here that um, technology and solutions have kind of locked uh, the city into certain areas and it's hard to uh, build on those. Uh, that also goes hand in hand having modular solutions um, so that we can start in one end and make it easy to purchase, easy to grow and easy, easy to scale. Uh, in relation to that, all the agreements, how to procure, uh, needs to enable development and innovation so that we can handle the fast innovation that is actually going on. Then, of course, security and privacy needs to be guaranteed, uh, one of the most important parts. And then uh, data availability, both internally within the city, but also as open data, so that it can be taken up by businesses and, and new innovation and other innovation can be done at the same time. So the leading cities in the world uh, within you know, being hyper-connected, there are um, an index and it's provided by a, a maturity index provided by ESI Thought Lab. And here we see a list of leaders. And uh, as you know, in place in Seoul, Seoul is definitely on the top of uh, this list in a lot of different kinds of indexes. Um, and from a Nordic perspective, we can see that we have Helsinki and Copenhagen there. But as you see, we had to have Stockholm in this list. Uh, we are seen as a leader uh, rather as an advancer at this point in time. Um, and if you look at the challenges uh, with building a hyperconnected city, uh, here are the global or general challenges from uh, this global analysis that ESI Thought Lab has done. And if we look at the top two here, gaining support of citizens and other stakeholders and making sure the speed of development keeps up with businesses and citizens' needs, those are not really um, the main challenges that we see from a Swedish or uh, Stockholm perspective. 
uh, Camcom, um, we are currently involved um, in a project and a program of uh, smart traffic control. And um, so we have some insights in what is, at least from a Stockholm perspective, uh, challenges that can have an impact on the progress of uh, the development in the highly connected city. And the two that we see sticks out is the complexity of procurement and policy and regulatory barriers. Uh, and an example I can give that uh, when we started our project one and a half years ago, um, the city uh, was about to uh, procure a new general uh, IoT platform that would collect and distribute all the data from all the different projects and uh, activities in the city. And now, one and a half years later, it's still not in place. Uh, the processes that are that we have are very much uh, trying to be preventing corruption uh, and having open and shared information. But it makes uh, the uh, process slow and not that flexible and not really adapted for fast and new innovation and partnerships that are required in those kinds of ecosystems. Um, and on the policy regulatory side, um, the, these are, the, the policies and regulations are really uh, interpreted in the most conservative way. Uh, and this is for the sake of privacy uh, for people or the and of course, that is a good thing, but it also has an impact on uh, development and introduction of new technology. Uh, and an example there is that for a single camera permit, it took one year to get in place. And the usage of the data is very restricted, both in time when it can be used and how it can be used, which makes it both difficult to verify that the solution is actually working as it should, uh, but also in the development that if you cannot download data, if you cannot get access to the data, or you can barely look at the data, then it's very hard uh, for introduction of new technology, like in, in this case, AI-based uh, technology. And um, if we look at just uh, how it looks in the world in terms of uh, cameras, um, we know that most of the cameras are placed in cities in, in China, uh, but we have London there on the on the top three. Uh, and, and that, of course, is a European city as well with similar regulations as we have in Sweden. And there we have 67 cameras per thousand inhabitants. And if we make a comparison with Stockholm, uh, then we have in, had in 2019 70 installed cameras. Um, so less than 0.1 cameras per thousand inhabitants. Uh, and it's not that I'm promoting that we should have a city full of, of cameras, but at least it puts a little bit perspective of um, uh, what the development is. And, and I'm not, I don't know how the numbers for 2020, but I know at least that there would be 21, not or 71 uh, cameras in place right now. Uh, but moving on, uh, so in Stockholm, um, they wanted to be a sustainable as well as a smart and connected city, um, where we, uh, in our case, are looking at implementing uh, an AI-based uh, multifunction system um, for the city. And, and that is one of the things that they're working on, that um, not just thinking of how do we fast get uh, new systems or new features in place, but how do we make it sustainable for the long run uh, that these data collection systems will need a lot of different sensors. How can you provide multiple functions with these uh, systems so that we avoid having a forest uh, of cameras or sensors uh, in the city? And the other part is really making them scalable. Uh, so we have industrial AI solutions that can work in the environment now, they can work over time, uh, we can add features, uh, we can add sensors to them so that they will be adapted for future needs. So these are things that also can have a like slowing down effect of the implementation of a hyper-connected city, but uh, could have a positive impact in the long run, both making it a nicer place where you can live and visit, uh, but also make it faster to actually add new features and new things uh, at a later stage. So, slow start, but we do have time to catch up before fulfilling the 2040 vision. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Anne. Thank, thank you very much for your 
contribution. And also, I hope your dream come true in 2040. Our final panelist is Professor Dimitra Simeonitu from Bristol, England. I'm very sorry for keeping you wait. So, uh, thank you very much for your patience. She's a chair professor, High Performance Networks, University of Bristol. She specializes in high performance networks, data center networking, software defined networking as well. She's a fellow of Royal Academy of Engineering, British Engineering Society Academy. Her, uh, she'll talk about human centering networks. The floor is yours, Dimitra. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to give a presentation here. I'm really delighted. Now I'm very aware that I'm coming last after a long list of amazing speakers. So I'll try to be brief. And uh, my intention is actually not to discuss about achievements here in the UK and Bristol, but actually to share some personal reflections and thoughts for the future. So myself and my team, the last three years, we have been very central in the UK in what we call a, a very big program on 5G testments and trials. And the focus of that program has been actually to create environments for trialing new applications and actually engage with vertical sectors in order to incentivize digital transformation of this, in these sectors through 5G deployment. And uh, we worked across many, many sectors. So cities definitely was one. Uh, we are working very much with our local government, with our smart city initiatives here at Bristol. But we worked across the country with health, transport, digital, creative, manufacturing, logistics. We looked at environmental and sustainability uh, interventions related to 5G and so on. Now, through this journey, I would like to reassure you that actually technology was almost never the concern and almost never the challenge. When we were talking to businesses and then when we were talking to communities, from a business point of view, the questions were not never about technologies, were about the business model. What is the business model? How we can get access to resources, specifically to skills? What is the framework for supply, for instance, of technology? And then what is the regulation that could help actually, let's say, enterprise or private 5G networks to be realized. Most importantly, and I take the city example, when we were talking to our citizens and our communities in the journey of actually proposing 5G for urban deployment, the questions were about safety. And I'm not going to talk about misinformation about uh, safety and 5G, health and 5G, but it was coming and is still coming very much at the forefront of the discussion was security, privacy, inclusivity. Is it inclusive or how is actually going to promote equality and inclusion in our cities? Are we innovating responsibly? Are we deploying responsibly and sustainable? What are the ethics around this? And the ethics, of course, they're related with data and data models and quite increasingly what this is going to mean for my future of work. So definitely digital connectivity as it's been highlighted persistently today with the previous talks is really a key enabler for digital transformation. And especially state of the art 5G and beyond 5G really can drive transformation if it is deployed responsibly because actually it enhances communications between people, devices, and things. So we heard today as well about this ultra high bandwidth, low latency, billions of hyper-connected devices making a hyper-connected world. And of course, emerging capabilities on big data and artificial intelligence that actually are going to allow us through our digital networks to actually 
experience applications in the future that they are even unimaginable now. My question is, is this enough actually? Is this enough? I mean, if we are looking today's networks, but also if we are looking 5G and beyond 5G network trends, our networks are very much device centric. So myself now I'm sitting in front of my laptop and I'm using Zoom to be here and do my presentation. And I'm really bounded by the capabilities of my device and actually the application that my device runs. So I interact with the digital environment, with cyber world through capabilities of my personal device. Now going forward, there is a prediction that by 2030, the number of internet connected devices are going to be about 500 billion. That is going to be 59 times more than the predicted world population in 2030. So you see what is happening. Devices are becoming the main users of our network. So if actually the industry is looking at this as focusing into delivering services into devices, and I have seen that this is quite a lot of conversation, for instance, when we are moving and start thinking about 6G, what is going to be the role of us as humans in that service delivery chain? So this is a good question and probably one to start thinking about and position how we would like to be part of this service delivery chain in the future as humans, as communities, as cities. I mean, whatever, you know, brings people together and their needs. So at the moment, our requests in services are mostly explicit. I log in into my laptop. I ask an internet connectivity service. I use Zoom to be here with you now. But there is no reason why this request could not be also implicit. So my implicit request right now is that actually Zoom is not good enough for me. And I would like physically to be there with you. And actually what is happening now is a huge compromise. So if I have actually to bound myself in virtual presence, I would like my virtual presence to feel as physical as possible. So this is an implicit intent from myself on how I would like to see services to be delivered in the future. Implicit actually intents are becoming more important when actually we are looking at emergencies. If you are having, for instance, a public safety emergency or a medical emergency, then implicit requests for services are absolutely critical. So the question is, can we actually start using a combination of devices and environmental data coming through smart infrastructures to infer what we can start calling as a human intent for a service? And inference here is very important word. We also heard a lot about artificial intelligence and how empowering and actually enabling is going to be in the future. But what is the role of human intelligence in the future, especially when we are talking about digital innovation and digital services of the future? So can we start talking about collective intelligence? I mentioned before about human inference or inference of human intent can actually look the intelligence that drives our network services in the future as the sum or the abstraction of what we get as implicit or explicit from humans and communities to gather information that we are getting with machines, to gather actual information with the status of the network and actually create that collective intelligence that could drive digital infrastructure and services for the future. So we really need what COVID taught us is that yes, digital infrastructure kept us going. And this is something that really we should be proud in our community that we created, you know, these capabilities, but it's really not enough. I mean, we cannot, we have to actually start making demands that our cyber world would actually start feeling very much like a physical world. And what are the next steps to make this convergence between cyber and physical world? 
And of course, in order to do this, to make this happen, technologies, talking to technologies is not enough. We start thinking about how we can design future digital infrastructure following not only technical principles, but also socio-technical principles. And there is a big international move, you know, and thinking about socio-technical and socio-digital. So in the future, can we actually create these teams? that they are not going to have all engineers and computer scientists, but they are going to include social scientists, humanities, geographers, psychologists, that we are all going to be co-designed and co-create together our digital futures. So before we jump into discussing 6G or 7G or whatever comes next, can we make a pause? Can we pause at this point and just start asking these questions on how we can drive actually the next generation of digital infrastructure with humans and human needs in the center. And I would like to finish with this and thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitra. Thank you. Thanks very much. And also very interesting perspective on digitization. Thank you. Right, the most important job of the moderator is, is timekeeping but I'm, I, I'm failed today. However, without proper question and answer session, the symposium is not a good one. Yeah? So even though you are behind our schedule, but I would like to have short question and answer time. Uh, Professor Kim, would you mind joining us to this podium? Here you are in here, yeah, and you and Youngte and and uh, uh, Dimitra and Professor Kim. We have a couple of questions from the audience, so I would like to uh, start from uh, Hugh. Yeah. And uh, the question is: It's very interesting that new technologies are rapidly being adopted with the pandemic. I thought it was difficult for the general public to adapt to the rapid technological advancement. But pandemic changed it. However, isn't it a more difficult world for people who are not familiar with these new technologies? Is there any good way to solve this problem? Huh. Well, um, there's no good way, but you've heard Demetra and myself talk about uh, human-centered design, which is a critical part of uh, being able to do this. Um, but I think the other lesson we've learned from technology is if there's enough need, people will adopt it. So if you look at my own academy, the demographic is older. 75% um, of the academy is over 65 years in age, and there was a significant resistance to using video conferencing for meetings. Um, obviously, during the pandemic, we've had to do it, and now there's quite a um, considerable enthusiasm amongst the fellows for using uh, Zoom in meetings. So, um, you know, you need a combination of good design and, and necessity. People don't adopt technology unless they see value in it. Thank you. Thank you. And also, another question to Professor Kim. Many technologies have changed the city as a platform for hyper-connection between machine-to-machine -machine or human-to-human. -human. Can you tell us any technologies or urban city designs that can help solve social inclusion issues that can lead to human-to-human hyper-connection? Yeah. This is really good question and tough. <clears throat> uh, we have a certain experience of pandemic in the, uh, in the past. Uh, then CT actually tried to overcome those issues. The first, we changed the infrastructures. And now, I think the human-to-human -human, uh, connection could be the most tricky one uh, in the world because the, uh, the origin of this disease is actually from the human. So uh, I can say this digital uh, hyperconnection, such as the, you know, the 
FaceTime and other uh, the image sending technology can be help the people's loneliness and solitariness. So probably it could be augmented solution. One could be healthy uh, the medical people or welfare person who is already immune to the uh, COVID-19 could be uh, take care of the people's uh, mental kind of um, um, take care. And the other thing is uh, uh, digital things. We have a lot of you know, mediums to connect uh, people to people. So I can say augmented uh, solution could be a uh, digital and analog version of treatment can be helpful. And mostly the, uh, someone who uh, doesn't reach the digital connection, then uh, city and government support speak, uh, contribute and uh, provide the uh, digital networking for the people. So, uh, actually, the, I and my research team are working on the, uh, those kind of issues right now. We don't have a good answer, but it is a really good answer, and we will working on those ideas. When we get the answers, we will let you know. Thank right. you. Thank you, thank you. Right, I'd like to close this question and answer time with simple question from myself. Right, this is to all speakers and the panelists. So hyper-connected life is coming. I think our lives is being more convenient and the quality of life also improving. But what is our happiness index? Will we be happier then? I would like to hear your candid opinion with just one sentence. This time from the rivers, I would like to ask Dimitra first. Well, depends what you mean, happiness. And we are under a pandemic, so I suppose happiness index are quite low mm -hmm. uh, in general. Um, happiness and hyperconnectivity, I think the ease of doing things through digital connectivity, for instance, and hyperconnected world is one aspect, so it makes things easier, but in my opinion, it doesn't necessarily make things happiness. Uh, we all take hyperconnectivity and digital, uh, you know, digital capabilities as a baseline now, especially after the few months. So we have to build, as I said in my statement, you know, capabilities and applications on top of that, which they are going to be focused on people's happiness, uh, you know, specifically to address problems of loneliness and mental health. Thank you. And? Um, well, I'll be short. I think that uh, technology itself uh, doesn't create happiness, but I think uh, this point of human-centric, uh, like we're having a future that is human-centric, then we, yes, it's an answer to the question, then there will be a higher happy Index, index. Okay, thank you. Professor Kim? Yeah, uh, I think uh, the answer could be in the urban design side, that is augmented placemaking. It is a harmonized, the, uh, customized, harmonized the uh, human request and uh, technology applications. So I can say uh, traditionally we use the technology as a um, second tools to have a happiness. So I can say augmented placemaking can be a solution. Thank you. Young Tech Kim? I think uh, the technology should come with uh, humanism and uh, a certain agreed, uh, the social value system or even philosophy. So there are two sides of one, one coin and if people realize that this is this can be used in negative way that that will definitely ruin people's life but uh, it, if uh, it can be used in a positive way people can realize that this is a really good thing so basically it's still too early to uh, say uh, 
if we really have a better life in the future with this uh, te technological development. But uh, I think uh, because we don't know, we all have to work together to make our life better in the future. Thank you. Hugh, you're the last person to answer. Well, I, I suppose my answer is that if it makes us less prone to disasters, like the people we love dying, then yes, it will make us happy. On the other hand, social networks have definitely made us more unhappy. So the answer is not a black nor white, but somewhere in between. Thank you. Right, now is the time to end the session. Today, we had great presentations from three speakers about the hyper-connected life. They explained us technologies that enable hyper-connected life, the relationship with pandemic, and how our lives would change in transport combined with ICT. And we were able to join insight from, gain insight from three panelists. They contributed about smart city and the desirable relationship between devices and human beings. I would like to thank you, everybody, who participated in this session. Now I declare to close the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you to all the participants of session two, entitled Hyperconnected Life from all over the world. Now we'll introduce another two startups that have made outstanding achievements over the past year. The third company to provide an IR pitch is Dot Incorporation. This company came to fame after creating a clock in Braille for the virtually impaired. Please begin your IR pitch. I would like to invite Ms. Chi Adam to the stage. Please give her a big round of applause. Yes. Hello, I'm Aram from Dot Incorporations. Dot found in 2015, um, the time I was joined here, so it's been a six amazing years since then. Dot was, um, Dot aimed to show a whole new level of tactile communication through our groundbreaking technology. In fact, there are 1 billion disabled people worldwide. Among them, 90% has a disability due to unexpected accident or a disease. So it suddenly come to our life and change our lifestyle as a whole. However, our city is not gonna change easily. So the hyper-connected city is not just for all people, for some people. Having disability uh, limit a lot of parti limits participation in society, like accessing health, education, transformation, um, and work, which many of us are taking for granted. So we'd like to make the world more accessible through the technology. In 2017, we invented that first, first generation of the dot cell. So with that, we launched the first Braille smartwatch, so, which is like hit this. This is like Apple Watch for the blind. In 2019, uh, the advanced version came out. So with that, we make a multi-layer device. Um, briefly, we have uh, two core technologies. First one is translation. Engine. So all text translate into its Braille. We support 11 languages so far, including English, Korean, and Chinese, etc. And the second one is teeny tiny um, Braille cell. So it can be applied in a variety of kiosks, such as like bank ATM, ordering kiosk, digital signage. This is the picture that I um, took from our factory located in Incheon, Bupyeong, in Korea. So, um, literally, we achieve 소재 부품 국산화. It's 90% uh, smaller, lighter, and affordable. Um, the total cost of total of manufacturing cost is um, one fourth of the price compared to this conventional technology called piezo actuators. That braille assistive technology device. It's a five thousand US dollar. 
and that one is the Braille version of the Bible. No one carried this when they go to church, and that one is concept design. Still um, didn't come out in the market. So briefly, we have uh, three core features. First one is the smallest in the world. The second one is lightest cell you've ever seen before. Last but not least, it's um, versatile, like Lego. You can make multi-layer display for graphic image. Um, it can display map image and also deliver a pleasant experience. For example, in museum, uh, tactile display show how sculptures or painting look like. The blind people touch it going up and down, and they can feel it. Um, moreover, accessible bus stop and subway station will come out soon um, in Busan, uh, which should be our first reference at the end of this year. And also, it's um, applied in other industry, such as beauty, financial, healthcare, automotive, and media. Going barrier-free is the most important value when it, uh, go, when it goes to um, the quality of the people with disability. We strengthen our collaboration with other company who already has uh, technology for the hearing impaired and physically impaired. So dots barrier-free infrastructures are gonna rapidly scale up in Korea, China, Middle East, and beyond, especially under this um, COVID situations. So here is the figure that we achieve. We've raised 10 million US dollars so far um, at Series B round, which is Pegisim Yugo, and 112 patents, including 88 technical one, and 27 member, 80% are R&D engineer, and other global winning awards. The point is, this is not important. Um, it's just the beginning. We still have a long way to go. So we dream of the city with easily um, accessible facility, having a variety of uh, friendly place for the people with disability. It's, um, it's not an achievable goal. It's just a system, an infrastructure based on our mindsets. So we'd like to make an authentic, uh, hyper-connected city, not just for some people, but for all people. Um, because we have solutions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation, Ms. Aram Che. Next company is, um, how can I pronounce this? It's Veeam AI from Finland, um, if I pronounced it right. <laughs> Yeah, this company yes. manufactures navigation devices that utilize AR technology. So let's give them a listen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ismo Akkan, I'm the CEO of uh, Vim AI. Uh, we focus on, on wide area augmented reality uh, and especially making, making it possible via visual positioning. So traditionally, uh, augmented reality has been based on, on markers that you glue on, on the floor or, or on the table or on the walls. And, and you start the uh, experience by scanning the, the, the marker, but that is not practical in, in, in wide area. Uh, if you want to make it uh, easy in, in uh, big spaces like airports, uh, uh, you cannot start gluing gluing any any markers in there, but you need to need to um, anchor the uh, digital content into the physical environment by using using uh, visual positioning. So just recognizing the location of uh, of the user and the and the viewing direction, and that's how you can add uh, digital content into the uh, mobile phone screen. Uh, hopefully, I can change the okay. Uh, there you go. Okay, it, it changed the slide. So um, 
Uh, here are some uh, examples of, of how to uh, build wide area uh, augmented reality experiences. While well, this is just an animation for uh, a shopping mall environment where you can have a static or animated uh, content, uh, you can interact with the, the uh, digital content by tapping on the on the content itself and, and well, it's it's just uh, based on your imagination what kind of digital content you you, you will have in the in this in the uh, surroundings or the in environment uh, but to have the uh, content in fixed locations for for all users you you need to be, be you need to anchor the uh, digital content into the surroundings by using a uh, uh, using uh, visual positioning. Uh, this is another example from uh, from a factory environment where you can see uh, different kinds of uh, AR content. Here, obviously, the content is not entertainment anymore. Uh, it can be, in all cases, uh, navigation uh, to different locations. But in in, in factory environment, uh, the content most probably is is something that uh, has more relevance in, in that context. It, it can be uh, exploded views of, uh, of some uh, machinery. Uh, it can be uh, IoT sensor information coming, coming from the backend system. Uh, like you can see here, there's, there's some alarming sensor over, over there. That sensor is not visible in the in the other other phone, but it's showing you that you should turn your your phone to that direction, and and you you would see the the actual content. And in the other other mobile phone, you you can see other other kinds of uh, information that is coming from the the backend system, whether whether it's uh, real time or or some uh, historic data it depends on 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 the needs. Uh, then a uh, third example uh, that this picture I actually took from some uh, Korean researchers and it's it's related to smart buildings and the, and the IoT and uh, augmented reality architecture in, in, in that context. But it, it's pretty much the same as, as in the industrial context. So, so you have a central system for your data management where you collect the, the uh, data from from different sensors and there you might have uh, also some uh, AR data sets separately uh, and uh, then you use a AR tracking uh, to see where the user uh, is located and, and what is the, the viewing direction to find out uh, what to show to the user in, in that uh, particular uh, location. Uh, and then, uh, thirdly, you can you can uh, in addition to uh, browsing the the uh, data content and have it visualized, you can also uh, control different uh, objects and, and devices within the building or, or, or the factory. The actual applications and services that that augmented reality uh, provides in in this case is. is uh, for example, uh, AR-based manual for, for different devices, AR-based uh, training and, and uh, controlling the devices and, and providing uh, instructions with augmented reality for, for maintenance and, and field service uh, needs. Uh, here is a short uh, demonstration video showing just uh, uh, the navigation capabilities with, with uh, AR guidance and uh, location-based AR content. Here, the content actually is, is very sim simple uh, text format content that you can see uh, in, in light green color. So here, the user has selected uh, our own uh, office room as a, as a navigation target, and the system starts guiding the, the person to the, uh, to the destination. And on the way, you can see uh, different kinds of uh, location-based uh, uh, AR content, like the, the text toilet in the in front of the, the toilet door. So uh, the system tracks continuously the user's mo movement based on, on uh, camera feed and also the motion sensors. So, so that's how it can keep it quite accurate. And, and then you can see that the... the system uh, guided the user to the, the right destination. 
So uh, this concludes my, my presentation. Thank you very much for your, your attention. Thank you for your attendance from Phil. And like their name, their technology is unique too. Uh, thank you again for your presentation. So with that, the first day of the Kate Symposium has come to an end. I would like to thank both uh, the on-site audience and the participants viewing us online virtually. At the same time tomorrow, another session will be held on two subjects, education for a smart society and climate change. So today, um, so many new and exciting ideas were brought to light today. So I look even more forward to tomorrow. This was Young and Young, and I wish everyone to have a great evening. Thank you again, everybody, and see you tomorrow.